Okay, you ready? Testing one, two, testing one, two, testing one, two. One, two, three, one, two, three. Beautiful morning in Bonita Springs. Not a problem to be found. that red tape about? Oh, actually, um, I'm going to go to the truck. Could you do a test for me? Yeah, I got it. All right, one, two. One, two, cameras are good. All right, we're getting a little bit of feedback. I'm going to raise my voice, no feedback. All right, we're good. All right, we're ready to rock and roll. Cool. Yes, there will be. Mic check, one, two, three, four. Check, one, two, three, four. Good morning.
stuff works. Check one, two, three, four. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing on a beautiful day here, Southwest Florida. Testing. You need more? More? Testing. We're going to keep testing. We're here in Southwest Florida on a beautiful day. Can you guys hear this? Good. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. One, two, three. One, two, three. Getting hello. I'm still talking. I'm still talking. Still making noise. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. I see one happy person. I'm seeing people maybe potentially about to be happy. Uh, I am indeed British. Thank you. South London. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, happy faces back there. How's it sounding? Overmodulated still? Good. I'm getting two goods. Two goods. I'll take two goods. Anyone got three goods? Three goods. Four goods. Four goods there, sir. Uh, two thumbs up. All right. Okay, cool.
Testing, one, two. Testing, one, two. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Check one, two, three, four.
Yeah, he's up, up north. Oh, I guess I'll go over here and sit back down. I could have to stretch my legs a minute. <coughs>
Check one, two, three, four. Everyone Check one, two, three, four. You. You're good.
Good morning. Bad accident on I-75, I'm sorry. We, we, wait, we were in tra really, really bad traffic, unfortunate uh, situation there. So we 
thanks for staying with us. We're sorry that we're late, but we're really happy to be back in Southwest Florida for the first time in 2023. And uh, we know we'll be back uh, many more times to do a whole host of different things. But today's announcement is really, really good. It was four years ago today that I came down to Bonita Springs. I think I had been in office for just a couple of days at that point back in January of 2019. And we came and, and we made an announcement that we were going to bring about a new era of stewardship for Florida's natural resources, for our water quality, and for restoration of our Everglades. We signed a major far-reaching executive order, which laid out the vision, laid out the policy, and laid out the fact that we were going to put our money where our mouth is when it came to many of these important uh, issues. And so uh, we said we'd fight uh, for, for the waterways against the blue-green algae, things like red tide, working uh, to better manage with the Army Corps, Lake Okeechobee, uh, also uh, making sure that we recognize the importance to, of our water to our economy, our fishermen, our tourism industry. I had come to Southwest Florida in 2018 during the campaign and you know you had a lot of the hotels and restaurants you know were doing very poorly because of some of the issues that were happening a lot of the fishing so we understood how important that was so we decided to do something about it and we made uh, promises to to do big things and i'm happy to say that in the last four years uh, we've delivered on the promises that we made that day four years ago <clears throat> And uh, I'm proud to be joined by a number of folks. Uh, we have our DEP Secretary, Sean Hamilton, uh, Chief Resilient Officer, Dr. Wes Brooks, Chief Science Officer, Dr. Mark Raines. And then one of the things we did that first um, uh, four years ago, signed the executive order, uh, but then we also took swift action and we replaced all the governing board members of the South Florida Water Management District. <laughs> And so we have a number uh, of folks from the district with us. Uh, Chauncey Goss, of, of course, people know from Southwest Florida. We also have the vice chairman, Scott Wagner, Alligator Ron Bergeron, Ben Butler, Charlotte Roman, uh, Jackie Thurlow Lipsish, and uh, Drew Bartlett, who is, uh, works for the district. So we appreciate uh, what they've been doing. They've probably done more in these four years than the district has done uh, any time in its history. And I, and I think I can say you have uh, a record amount of water that's now flowing south uh, through the Everglades and into Florida Bay. And Florida Bay is doing as good as it's done in many decades, I think. So uh, the, 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 uh, it, we needed them uh, there making managing these projects. We also have uh, from Captains for Clean Water, uh, Daniel Andrews, Chris Whitman, and Rhett Morris, all captains. I want to thank them. Uh, for their support from really the beginning. We have uh, Anna Upton from the Everglades Trust, and then from the Everglades Foundation, CEO Eric Eichenberg, Carlos De La Cruz uh, with the uh, Everglades Foundation, uh, Kelly Cox, Audubon, Florida, uh, Dr. Michael Crosby, where's he at? I didn't see, okay, from uh, CEO of Moat Marine. So one of the things that we did was we decided to basically resurrect the Red Tide Task Force. And we put money in not just with FWC, but also with a partnership with Moat Marine. So they're actually testing things to mitigate red tide blooms. And uh, there's things that are promising, but we've put money in for research um, on that because you know, at the end of the day, I mean, red tide happens. It's not like it's something that, uh, that, that we're necessarily doing. Maybe some of the things humans do contribute, but that, that's been happening since uh, the 1800s. It's very well, well documented, um, but it has a big effect. And so is there things you can do to mitigate? So we've been able to do that and they're working hard and we're, we're happy with that. And then we have Ep Representative uh, Adam Botana, Senator John Martin, and new Representative Tiffany Esposito. Where is she at? Where are they at? Okay, welcome. <clears throat> so we said that we were going to seek, uh, four years ago, $2.5 over the over my four-year term 
for uh, water quality, Everglades restoration, and those really key projects. That goal represented a $1 billion increase over the previous four years. And so there's a lot of people that were, were happy that we uh, announced this and were, were pleased, but most people were not thinking we'd be able to, to deliver on that, just given that it was ambitious. Uh, well, what we ended up doing over four years was not $2.5 billion, but $3.3 billion. <laughs> And part of it is uh, we were really committed to making a difference. We had good partners um, in the legislature, uh, but part of it is the state has done well. Uh, we have big budget surplus. I mean, you had everybody uh, in their mother was down in Florida over the last couple years. I mean, it's just crazy the number of people that are down here at any given time. Of course, people moving here, but also visiting here. And we were really, I mean, by far, when you start talking about like 2020, 2021, I mean, we were number one destination by far. And so that has helped uh, really fill our coffers. And we're even in most recent month, I think we were uh, $450 million higher in revenue than, than was anticipated. And so, you know, those are things as you budget, that's money coming in, you know, not because there's taxes are changing, it's just because there's more economic activity uh, and the economy's growing. And so that would not have been possible you know, if we had turned Florida into a Fauciville, it would not have been possible. And so we had to make sure to do the right thing. <clears throat> so of the 3.3 billion, of course, there's a whole host of important things in that water quality. The, the chunk of that for Everglades restoration was almost as much, 1.7 billion was almost as much as the previous 12 years combined in the state of Florida. So that was really good. So we now have, uh, since, since our efforts, uh, we've been able to expedite projects. And so more than 50 Everglades restoration projects um, have either been completed, broke ground, or have hit a major milestone in the last four years. And so the pace has been great, um, and we want to make sure that we're keeping it up. Of course, we have had fewer harmful discharges out of Lake Okeechobee over these last four years than we had in the previous. That's just part of that is a function of working with the Army Corps to manage Lake Okeechobee differently. Uh, part of it is we actually have technologies we go in to mitigate some of the algae in the lake uh, before it ends up uh, leaving. So there's been a whole host of things that have been really, really good. Uh, we're going to continue doing on that. Uh, we also did $1.6 for water quality and supply improvements. So we established a wastewater grant program to up, update uh, wastewater infrastructure, including, uh, in some parts of the state really needed this, converting septic to sewer, uh, which, is, um, which is important. Uh, we've also done record funding to restore Florida's springs. Uh, we've invested in alternative water supply projects. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the technologies to treat, predict, and respond to algae blooms, both the blue-green algae and the red tide. Uh, we've done more on that than I think probably in the whole history of the state uh, when, when you think about what we've done. So we're, we're proud to have done that. And of course, we have also signed substantive legislation 2000. We signed the Clean Waterways Act, uh, which was a big improvement for the state of Florida. Uh, we've also done things like do 1.1 billion in resilience projects. Uh, to help fortify our communities. If you notice, when Ian came through, the, the things that had been more recently hardened or fortified did a lot better. In fact, you would not have had the power on in some areas for maybe six or eight weeks, but you had some of the substations there had been big improvements to because it was a strong enough storm, if it wasn't done, it would have knocked a lot of this out entirely and you'd had no chance. Um, so, so these things are important and we want to make sure, and that's usually the local uh, communities applying for a grant. We match the grant um, and they can do things like uh, really protect and fortify things like critical infrastructure. Uh, we also signed legislation. This was not in the executive order, but it's something that we did subsequent. 
we did the Florida Wildlife Corridor, and so that's over $600 million. Uh, we've also done for land conservation, but the, that Wildlife Corridor is really a historic thing. There's going to be more that we do to be able to add to that, but that's going to be something that generations of Floridians will be able uh, to enjoy. So we're really, really excited uh, to have made good uh, on promises and to show huge uh, improvement and, and make big progress. And, you know, a lot of people always say they're going to do things and then they just never follow through or they do it halfway. Uh, we followed through and we did it to the hill. <laughs> now, uh, lest you think that we're here today to kick up our feet and to soak in the sun, although it's a really nice day outside, um, uh, that's not what we're here. We're here to put it into an even higher gear uh, and make sure that we build off the progress and the success that we've had over these last four years. And so today, on the fourth year anniversary of our, our original executive order, we are signing another executive order, 23-06, to ensure that we continue our historic momentum and conserve Florida for future generations. And so there's going to be a whole host of things that, that we're going to be accomplishing with this. One, in terms of our Everglades and, uh, wa and uh, protection for water resources, four years ago we asked, we pledged $2.5 billion over four years. This one we're going to pledge $3.5 billion over four years. And we, we look forward to being able to do that, and we're glad we've gotten such great support. Uh, I'm also in this executive order directing the Department of Environmental Protection uh, to identify and prioritize strategies and projects to expedite water quality restoration in the Indian River Lagoon, which is the most biologically diverse estuary in North America. So we've done a lot on Indian River since I've been governor. Uh, we are looking to establish an Indian River Lagoon protection program and to secure at least $100 million each year for projects uh, to improve water quality. We're also directing the Department of Environmental Protection to expand partnerships to identify and prioritize projects to restore the Indian River Lagoon uh, and to undertake enhanced uh, water quality monitoring in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, we're also directing the Department of Environmental Protection to work with the Florida Legislature to expand our existing wastewater grant program to include other project types to address impacts from non-point sources like stormwater and agricultural runoff. Uh, so DEP will be working with local governments and water management districts to identify the most effective and beneficial water quality improvement projects. I'm also directing uh, the South, uh, South Florida Water Management District to continue expediting Everglades restoration projects, including projects that reduce the risk of harmful discharges and that will send more water south to the Everglades and Florida Bay. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of the things we've been doing have been great. The feds are involved in the southern reservoir. They don't move quite as quick um, as we do, uh, but we don't want to see this thing languish and get mired in bureaucracy. So we want to make sure that our water management district is holding the core accountable for progress so that we can continue uh, to put points on the board. We're also going to ensure that the new low sum is implemented in a manner that reduces harmful discharges to the estuaries by holding water in the lake during the wet season and sending more water south to the benefit of the environment uh, that will meet the needs of the communities. And we've had, that's been something that's been worked on for many, many years. Additionally, I'm directing DEB to strengthen basin, ma basin management action plans. They call them BMAPs to include the specific projects necessary to achieve um, our restoration goals, and they will be working with the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services uh, on that effort. I'm also directing DEP to work with the uh, Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to improve agricultural best management practices, which are important measures to reduce nutrients from entering our waterways, um, inc including obtaining site-specific data on BMP implementation. We'll also work to continue our progress towards reducing the frequency of algal blooms uh, by 
We have one of the things I did in the initial executive order, we establish a blue-green algae task force, uh, as well as I mentioned the red tide task force. Uh, so we're going to continue to lean on those entities uh, to provide uh, additional policy solutions uh, that we can undertake to continue uh, to make gains in this regard. We are going to continue. Uh, we created a red tide emergency grant program uh, that we successfully deployed uh, last year in the Tampa Bay area. Or what was it last year or two years ago? Do you guys, two years? I think it was two years ago. Uh, we did. And what happens is, you know, you have a bloom, there'll be the fish, and it's, it's terrible, but we have the grants, and the cleanup happens very rapidly. And it lets it recover quicker. When that festers there for days and weeks, it gets really, really bad, and it ends up creating a negative cycle. So we have that for red tide. We're also going to have a similar program for blue-green algae blooms. And so there'll be ways to be able to send, uh, to mitigate. You know, we've got different companies that have been involved in, in mitigating the algal blooms. I got a company from Israel that's down there doing stuff in Lake Okeechobee. So we have the ability uh, to mitigate, and it really makes a difference. And so those are, I think, dollars uh, very, very well spent. Uh, we're also directing our chief resilience officer and the DEP to continue our efforts to increase the resilience of our communities, uh, particularly as we've seen with, with these major weather events. Uh, and we've done a lot, and we'll do more. Uh, we just passed uh, a big, uh, the legislature just passed a big package in December uh, to help with the hurricane affected areas, not just Southwest Florida. You, know, you actually had some on the east coast of Florida that got hit by Nicole, which you know, Nicole was not the biggest hurricane in the world, but coming on the heels of Ian, which also, you know, was the effects were far inland and all the way to the East Coast, you know, you had major erosion of the coast. You had buildings that were that were falling in. Uh, so we're doing things like resilient coastlines. Uh, we're doing things, of course, like the Resilient Florida program. We also are going to establish a coral reef restoration and recovery initiative to increase coral uh, and deployment to enhance coastal flood and storm surge protections. And so uh, this, that's something that's very, very important, and we're going to continue to make progress there. So all being told, uh, this may be a bigger, more comprehensive executive order than we did four years ago, but I think that's the right thing to do. You, uh, you can make progress, you can do good things, and you just got to keep pressing forward. And I know uh, we have so much momentum that I think you're going to see a lot of support in the legislature for this, uh, and I think we're going to continue to be able to do good things for the people uh, all throughout the state of Florida. So I'm excited to be able to sign this today. <laughs> I'm excited to be able to sign this today, and I'm excited about continuing uh, to make more progress um, in the future. And I'm also just glad that, that we could come back here four years to the day uh, of our initial opening salvo when I first became governor uh, and be able to say, promises made, promises kept. Amen. Okay, Sean Hamilton. All right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and cancel all those vacations. Um, just, yeah. No, thank you, Governor. It's an honor to be here today to celebrate this historic occasion. Um, if you, as you think about the achievements that the Governor outlined, and I think obviously we should be even more excited about what the future holds as we think about the momentum the Governor just outlined in the executive order. And as you guys can easily tell, the Governor has long recognized the importance of our water resources to our state, how they're fundamental to our life, to our environment, to our economy, and candidly, the unique ecosystems that make up Florida. And that's why exactly he said four years ago to today, he issued an historic executive order outlining that bold vision. Um, the governor mentioned calling for $2.5 billion for Everglades restoration and water quality projects. And not only did we achieve that goal, I think whether depending on good or bad, he's kind of set the expectation what it looks like to achieve a goal. And so with that in mind, we look forward to doing everything as an agency to make sure we're a part of that and can come back, you know, maybe four years to the day and talk about how we blew that out of the water. So through these unprecedented funding um, investments, you know, the state has prioritized all of the things the governor talked about, ex expediting Everglades restoration, again, reducing those harmful discharges to our estuaries, 
creating a water grant program, a wastewater grant program that invests in advanced wastewater treatment, septic to sewer conversions, again, all about getting the nutrients out of our waterways, and investing $1.1 billion for the resilience of our communities. Again, a key foundation as we go forward. And one of my, one of my favorites, of course, is acquiring more than 170,000 acres of conserva conservation land. That's nearly four times the previous four years, and that's what momentum looks like. And so, you know, we've accomplished a lot. There's a lot more to be done. And this order directs the additional funding, the strategic action that will enable us to continue that momentum and our ongoing efforts to expedite critical Everglades restoration, employ sound science to protect and restore our waterways, fund infrastructure projects to improve our water quantity and quality, and improve the resilience of our communities. Again, Governor, thank you for the executive order as we look to do even more now for Florida's environment. Thank you. Okay, Chairman of the South Florida Water Management Distri District, Chauncey Goss. Uh, thank you so much, Governor. It's a real honor to be here today, and welcome back to Southwest Florida. I know you've been here a lot more recently than you probably wanted to be, but I can tell you that as a lifelong resident of Sanibel, um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you, um, your staff, and your team have done for Southwest Florida. I just want to say thanks. So four years ago today, um, I wasn't chairman. I hadn't been nominated. I was a spectator in the audience, and I was standing down there, and it was really, really cold. And I don't know if any of you were here, but I just remember being cold, really uncharacteristically cold for, for Southwest Florida. And I think you made a joke about Lambeau Field at, at the time, because I think it, it felt like Lambeau Field. And, and I remember thinking, OK, this new governor, he's been, been on the job for maybe a week or two, he just, just gave us this executive order. Who's going to do all this? <laughs> and that, what, what's really interesting now is you say, okay, who's going to take those, those dollars and, and turn them into projects? And who's going to take this incredible challenge and make it so it's not a homework assignment, but make it so it's the opportunity of a lifetime? And that, that's, that's what I came to find the answer to that was partially the staff of the South Florida Water Management District, because I was not on the board at the time. I did not know the staff. I did not know the agency very well. And I cannot tell you how impressed I have been, because they have stepped up. And they are incredibly, incredibly capable. And these people, when you give them something to do, they do it. They want to be challenged. And this has been a challenge. So it, it's, it's an incredible honor for me, and I know for my other governing board members, and, and for Executive Director Bartlett to be able to say to our staff, thank you for the last four years, and get ready for the next four. Because as <laughs> the Secretary just said, there's not going to be a lot of vacation time. So in the, last, in the last four years, we've got those 55 projects. They're either new starts, they're either completions, or we've reached major milestones. That's incredible. That's that, that $2.5 billion, which is actually more than $2.5 billion. We've seen that expended very well. Um, and, and it's not just the projects. And that's something that people focus on a lot. It's like we're turning dirt, we're doing projects. But, but why? We're doing it for results. And that's what's really important is we're starting to see the results now. We're starting to see better water quality down in Florida Bay. We're starting to see some, some differences in, in the way the birds are migrating, the way the birds are nesting. We're starting to see the results that we want to see that are good for Florida's ecology and good for Florida's economy. And that, that's what this is really all about. So I, I'm, I'm so excited to be doing this. Um, working with you, Governor, has been awesome. And the, it's not just the projects. It's not just the results but it's also the policies. We're looking at incredible policies here. We look at what we did with LOSUM, what the Corps has been doing with LOSUM. We have not had toxic discharges for a reason. It's because we're managing the lake better for a reason. It's because of this governor working hard with the district, working hard with the Corps to make sure it doesn't happen. So good things can happen. The uh, future is just incredibly bright for Florida. Thanks. And I know they're working on C43 Reservoir, so that'll be uh, something I know that, that this part of the state will, will love to see when that is, uh, when that is fully operational. Okay, uh, CEO of the Everglades Foundation, Eric Eichenberg. Good morning. Um, thank you, Governor. Uh, yes, uh, four years ago, I want to 
point out it was less than 48 hours <laughs> after taking the oath of office that we were right here in Bonita Springs where that executive order was unveiled. And as uh, folks who have been toiling uh, at Everglades Restoration and hearing that bold vision four years ago, I remember uh, stating that it couldn't get any better. Well, it just did. <laughs> and let's uh, realize that the projects that have been outlined to restore America's Everglades, a natural treasure right here in our own state, cannot happen, cannot happen without dollars, resources, commitments to go towards these projects. The governor just mentioned the C-43 reservoir. There had been dreams about having a reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee that would store, clean, and send water south through the River of Grass, under the bridges of Tamiami Trail, and into Florida Bay. It wasn't until this governor took office and made that project the number one priority to make sure it became a reality. And the state of Florida, under his leadership, has finished the stormwater treatment area that complements that reservoir. And thankfully, due to all the urging and the pressure and all the encouragement that the DeSantis administration has done and the governor, the Army Corps, and the Congress is finally making that reservoir a priority. They followed his lead to make sure it happens. So today now, Today now, with, with reaffirming a $3.5 billion commitment from the state of Florida to have these projects finished, when Congress passed the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan in the year 2000, it outlined a 30-year plan to restore the Everglades. Thanks to this governor and this commitment today, we see the finish line by 2030. These projects will be finished. We will have a better uh, water quality. We will have a better Everglades. We will be able to pass it on to the next generation. And today, Governor Ron DeSantis has cemented himself as the Everglades governor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, Captain Rhett Morris. Hi there. I've been a fishing guide in the local waters of the greater Caloosahatchee estuary for almost 40 years. And in the time that I've been doing this for a living, I've seen a lot of changes, not really good changes until just recently. I currently support my beautiful wife, Joellen, as well as my amazing six-year-old daughter, Sage Marie. And our family, along with many others, depends on clean water to make a living here in Southwest Florida. In the summer of 2018, I witnessed a red tide event that was recorded as the largest loss of marine life in Florida's history. This left myself and many other fishing guides with a very sinking feeling as to whether or not we were gonna be able to continue to support our families off the waters here in Southwest Florida. Since that summer, a major change has happened in the political will here in the state. This incredible change took place the day that Governor Ron DeSantis came into office. From that day, this great man gave us his word. He promised to fight for us like never before, and fight for us he did. By committing state funding and efforts to restore and protect local waterways, which are the lifeblood of all of our coastal communities, things began to look better. We as local charter captains immediately rallied up behind Governor DeSantis to support his new innovative ways that focused on keeping the beaches and waters clean in our area for the first time in decades. This proactive and refreshing new direction has really been a godsend to the entire Captains for Hire industry, as is Governor Ron DeSantis to the entire state of Florida. Yes, thank you. It is my heartfelt honor to stand up here today and represent many local captains who sincerely offer our collective gratitude by saying, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for, this for making this momentous announcement you have today. 
and showing us that you have a continued level of commitment to protect our livelihoods by leading us by leading the great state of Florida in a new direction that undoubtedly will bring on a brighter future for all. Well, thanks so much. We really appreciate uh, kind words. Also want to thank uh, Coconut Jacks for hosting us here today. And And I know they're going to be uh, up and running, I guess, in just a couple weeks, right? They're working on uh, getting everything situated. So I'd encourage everyone to come and, and check it out when they, when they get back uh, up and running after, uh, you know, after this. I can't believe how much water they had. I mean, it was unbelievable. So thanks for that. And, um, you know, thanks, um, uh, everybody, for uh, supporting our efforts. I hope everybody had a, a Merry Christmas and are having a Happy New Year. You know, we... Um, uh, I mean, we got a six, a four, and a two-year-old, so it's like, you know, it's like people, you know, did you enjoy, did you, did you relax? And no, we did not relax, unfortunately, <laughs> because, you know, you just, you got the, you got toys, you got this, they're not in school and everything like that. Um, but I will say, you know, my wife and I were, were thinking about with the inauguration, you know, we knew that the two, look, two is tough, like they, they just, so, so we knew that, but with the six and four, you know, we were like, guys, you're going to do, you're going to, and they behave very well. And we were very excited, and so the, the next day, I, uh, my wife and I took them um, and got them some, some toys to thank them for, for being so nice. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, they get all these toys, and this wasn't true, I don't think, when I was a kid. All this stuff is made in China, and a lot of it breaks. It's, it's cheap stuff. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, okay, you, you get it from China because it's cheaper to pay, but if it doesn't even last a week, then what difference does it make? So a lot of these things we got, uh, you get, we need to figure out Santa Claus may need to not do <laughs> Chinese toys because uh, <laughs> let's just make it, make it here, make it honestly anywhere, but not China. So it's really frustrating, but, um, but we're, we're, we're thankful for, for everybody. And uh, some of you were able to come up last week, you know, the inauguration. So I want to thank you for doing that. And we were, we were happy to be able to, to ring in a new administration. And I think if you've followed some of the headlines, you can see we're already uh, at work uh, very strongly. So with that, I'm happy to take a couple questions back there. Yes, ma'am. Well, look, I, I think what we did is we've made this a priority in the state of Florida. And we did it partially because it's the right thing to do. I mean, I've said four years ago, and then I re, uh, reiterated that on last Tuesday, uh, we need to leave Florida to God better than we found it. It's just something that we have to do. Now, by doing that, you're also fortifying the economic engine that this state represents. I mean, the people that are coming uh, to visit they want to visit, they want to go to the beaches, they want to go fishing, they want to go boating, they want to do those things. So that's just the lifeblood of our state's DNA, uh, and so it's the right thing to do, but it also reinforces, I think, our, our economic objectives, and the fact of the matter is, you look at our surplus, you look at all this stuff we've been able to do, and not just here, you know, we just did the biggest toll relief program in the history of Florida. So there's people, and you know, I know they have some tolls here, some parts of the state, it's like you can't commute to work without getting hit with these tolls. So that's a 50% reduction. You look at what we've done, we've raised teacher salaries, we did bonuses for police officers coming in from out of state. We've done so many different things. We did the biggest tax relief in Florida history last year, we're gonna do much more this year. Um, all of that is because the state has been managed well and you have good fiscal stewardship and you have this surplus and so you're able to do a bunch of different things. And so uh, I think it's just about you know, what you prioritize. I know other people have done stuff in the past, but I think we've really uh, kind of taken the bull by the horns and go forward. Um, in terms of the resignation you know, of the other party's chairman, uh, there ain't many, as many Democrats around as there used to be in the state of Florida, and we had something to do with that in November of 2022. <laughs> And if you think this is the first time, so Tuesday uh, after the inauguration, because this wasn't just the governor, it was all the cabinet members, it was the first time in 150 years 
that there's not a single Democrat in statewide office in the state of Florida. And that, and, and 150 years ago, when that was the case, you know, that was like reconstruction, so it wasn't even like normal elections then. So really, I mean, in the modern era, it's the first time that that's ever happened. But you know, I think that part of it is, I think they have a knee-jerk uh, reaction to anything I do, and, um, and I think it's put them in a corner where they're basically playing uh, to the woke choir, which is a very small minority of people. I mean, you know, so it's just, they're not addressing issues, I think, that really, really matter to folks. And so um, they really need a whole course correction and a big overhaul. I don't think they're gonna do it because I think the incentives are to continue to do what they're doing on an individual basis. And so uh, they can sort all that out. Um, I'm just happy that, you know, I was leading the charge to be able, uh, you know, to win a historic victory in November. Yes. You know, I'll, I, I, I'll refer you to Kevin Guthrie on that. I mean, you know, as you know, we've done our own state initiative partially because we understand that that can take longer. Uh, so I know he is working with them, but what we've basically done is if they're not doing it, you know, we're kind of diving in on it. So, so Kevin has gotten trailers on people's property. You know, the issue why states typically don't do that is because, you know, unless they're guaranteed to get reimbursed, they're very hesitant to do that. And our view is, is look, we think we're entitled to be reimbursed for it, but we're not just going to sit there and twiddle our thumbs. Uh, if we can do it and then they fight us over it, fine, we'll have that battle. So that's basically what we've done. But he would know because he's in contact with FEMA about when exactly they are going to do. But I, am, I do think it was good that we decided, hey, let's be the first state to ever launch our own housing initiative. And it would have been better not to have to do that. But the reality is uh, on these things, I think the, the speed of action and if people cons consistently see progress being made, I think that that's just good for the recovery. I also think it's good for morale. I mean, if you think about when those bridges open, that was a big deal, obviously, to get people back and forth and the responder, and that was very important. But it was also just people that never even go to those islands, I think, felt better about it, just seeing all the trucks going across. And so that's, I think, kind of the thing with the housing is, yes, it's important for those people that get it. But if we can be making progress, and I know FEMA just takes a little bit longer, that's just the reality. Yeah, so the question's about the, uh, uh, the property insurance market. So the legislature passed a series of reforms in the special session in December, uh, which really brings Florida in line with almost every other state that has functional insurance markets. Uh, our market was really, uh, I think, attracted a lot of litigation. It was very good for, for trial lawyers and, and assigning benefits to contractors, uh, but it was not good for the consumer. And so I think those uh, negative incentives were addressed in that bill. There was also uh, an effort to provide an availability for buying reinsurance coverage because that market is in flux. Now it's not just Florida, that's all around the world. Uh, so, so I think that they were very, very positive steps. But at the end of the day, you know, the biggest problem that we've had is that for going back, you know, 2006, 7, 8, They've chased companies out of Florida, so then you end up, you don't have any options, of course you're gonna pay more. Uh, the way you put a downward pressure is that one company knows you have four or five other options and they have to compete for your business. No one has been competing for anybody's business um, in Florida, and that's part of it. Now, having said that, uh, you know, we have the worst inflation we've had in, in 40 years. Uh, it costs a lot more to repair a roof today than it did just three years ago. That's just the reality. Um, and so those costs that have escalated across the board in our economy are going to be reflected um, in different things across the board. Yep. So my, my view on the, our economy is in Florida is, you know, we don't want to have holdings uh, by hostile nations. And so if you look at the Chinese Communist Party, they've been very active throughout the Western Hemisphere in gobbling up land and investing in different things. And, you know, when, when they have interests that are opposed to ours and you see how they've wielded their authority, and uh, especially with President Xi, who's taken a, a much more Marxist-Leninist turn 
uh, since he's been ruling China. Uh, that is not in the best interest of Florida to have the Chinese Communist Party owning farmland, owning land close to military bases. But, you know, my view is, and I think oh, there's a broad agreement in those two, but my view is, okay, yeah, no farmland, but why would you want them buying residential developments or things like that? I don't want them owning uh, subdivisions and things like that. Uh, I think that the issue is just going to be, I, I think people agree with that. The issue is going to be, yeah, obviously, if someone comes in and buys, it's not the CCP that's signing that. These are holding companies and all that. So you got to structure that in a way that will effectively police it. But yes, we do not need to have CCP influence um, in Florida's economy. We've already taken steps. Uh, we banned the Confucius Institutes from our universities and our state colleges, which they have used those Confucius Institutes across the country uh, to basically bring propaganda into our universities, as if our universities don't have enough problems already. Uh, so, so you do that. And, um, and so I think that that's something that, that's been very good. We've also done things uh, to limit their ability to fund research in our, in our universities. I think we're going to go even further than that. The legislature only went so far a couple years ago. I think there's an appetite to do even more because their influence in our society has been very insidious. Uh, if you look, very powerful in entertainment. They're very powerful in finance. I mean, you know, you will have some of these, uh, Disney, you know, they will, they will change things to be able to placate uh, the CCP. Wall Street uh, will bend to, put, to placate the CCP. But it's a larger issue, and we're just one, yes, we are, we are pretty big fish now. I mean, I think we have the 13th or 14th biggest economy in the world if we were our own country in Florida. So, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're a force to be reckoned with. But, you know, from the broader U.S. economy, uh, we're way too intertwined with China economically, and it hurts us. It hurts our economic vitality. It hurts our uh, security. I mean, when COVID hit, people needed all these supplies. I think like 100% of it was made in China. Why would you want a hostile nation to rely on a hostile nation for things that are integral uh, for, for, for our quality of life and security. Of course, you wouldn't want to do that. But this has been going on for, for many, many decades. So disentangling from China, you know, I think is something that's very, very significant uh, going forward. And, you know, you're... <laughs> and you're not going to see people acknowledge that, you know, they're, they do this thing in Davos. They're doing it next week. All these elites come in. Um, you know, the World Economic Forum, and basically, um, you know, their vision is they run everything and everybody else is just like a serf, like a peasant. They say they're going after energy, ESG, all these other things. And you, know, you see the Biden administration wants to, to nix gas stoves. Are you kidding me? Like, we need, <laughs> I want gas stoves. I mean, imagine, like, you, how many people had the hurricane come through didn't have power right away, but were able to turn on us. Uh Okay, everybody, make sure you come to Coconut Jack's uh, very soon. They'll announce when the doors are, are back open, and uh, we'll be back uh, soon as well to do some more uh, uh, hurricane, uh, hurricane assistance, so, so stay tuned on that. Thank you very much. Which way this goes?